The International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, ICIJ, releases the Pandora Papers, which exposes financial secrets of rich and powerful and implicates 10 Nigerian politicians. And Arawa Group tells Northern Governors to seal any shop closed in solidarity with IPOP's sit-at-home order. And again, something is happening in Abia State. This is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Ann Cole. The Pandora Papers are cash of uh, about 11.9 million files, which shows the secret deals and hidden assets of some of the world's richest and most powerful people have been revealed in the biggest trove of leaked offshore data in history. Ten Nigerian politicians have been named in the scandal for flouting laws and legislations as they hide Assets. Among some of these are Governor Abubakar Bagudu of Kebi State and Peter Obi, an ex-governor of Anambra State. No less than 10 Nigerian politicians have also been implicated in the Pandora Papers. At least eight African countries featured in the document. Well, joining us to break this down is Ladikbo Johnson, a legal practitioner, Kofi Batels, a broadcast journalist, and Agogo Obo, a foreign affairs expert. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. Good Thank day. you very much. All right. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Agogo, because it's not just a Nigerian situation, it's an international situation. And as I, I stated in the opener, we have several countries, including African countries, and Nigeria has 10 politicians and highly placed in, individuals in that particular expose. Um, but let's start with the guys um, on the international scene. We see, um, not necessarily directly, but we, see, we hear that Putin um, is one way or the other um, linked to some of these leaks. We've seen the Czech Republic Prime Minister, we've seen former Prime Minister, British Prime Minister uh, Tony Blair, um, um, we've seen the King of Jordan. I mean, the list is such a rich, and very famous list. Um, let's start by looking at the personalities of these people and what this could do, or the damage that it could do to, you know, um, their statuses. Yeah, it's, it's, it's remarkable. Uh, when you compare this with previous uh, releases that have happened, there was um, the, the Panama Papers, you remember, a couple of years ago. They also had the Paradise, um, all, all carried out by the ICIJ also too. So, um, in context, many of many of the things that they've put out, um, many of those names you find there have also been in previous releases, uh, which have been put uh, before this uh, 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 this put out put out before this uh, Pandora box. <laughs> We're gonna go Panama and Pandora box. Yes. Yeah, so they, they they you have many of those names replaying and repeating themselves and. What uh, many people have argued, uh, which I'm sure Adipo Jones will help explain to us, is uh, the difference in whether they've, they've exactly done what is illegal or the hypocrisy, uh, like uh, former UK Prime Minister Tony um, Blair has been, uh, been mentioned, saying that, for example, you've been very, very um, loud and outspoken about people, the rich, exploiting the systems and not being able to pay the taxes. And then at the end of the day, you go and then you find a way to not pay the taxes that you should pay in the 6.2 million pounds um, uh, real estate investment where he's been mentioned with. So those are all the things. I also uh, took, uh, took a lot of interest in the African leaders' names that we mentioned. We have um, the Kenyan president, Uhuru Kenyatta, uh, who's been mentioned. And interestingly, what he said directly was that um, he, he's doing something now. When he gets the opportunity, he will have the opportunity to respond. What he thinks is going to be uh, opportunity to, to look at the transparency behind the entire thing. It sh sort of speaks to the sort of uh, approach he wants to go around this. And if you listen to many people in Nairobi, uh, the Kenyan capital, they seem, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll play along with what the president is saying. He's not saying that what he did was right. He's saying that give me the opportunity to explain what exactly has happened. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting angle that is taken. A lot different from um, people like... Um, 
the Gab Gabonese pres president, Ali Bongo, whose family has been in power through his father, Omar Bongo, in the 60s up until now. His name is mentioned together with uh, neighboring Congolese president, uh, Denis Sassou Nguesso. Uh, these are people who've, who've run shadowy governments for a long while. They've been in government for multi-decades. And uh, I'm not, I don't see how this will in any way change the perception within their people. I mean, they've held on the reins of government, irrespective of what the Western world has taught. So it's interesting to see a number of African leaders who have been mentioned. Um, there's a former prime minister of Mozambique who was indicted uh, before he was removed. He's, he's also found his name in there. There's a, there's a prime minister of Cote d'Ivoire also, too, who's also been mentioned in this um, interesting list. But it would be good to see what, ha what happens in the coming days uh, which four uh, uh, very important personalities will, will be put there. But by and large, I try to compare and contrast the sort of uh, uh, um, um, elected political office holders you find on that list in Africa compared to the rest of the world. It still pales in comparison. You probably want to see more uh, going by the lack of transparency with many African governments. You should find more names there than what we've seen. Uh Kofi, you, you, I mean, we all know, as journalists, we report these things, and it, it was a group of journalists, about 600 of them, who came together to put out this, um, you know, um, expose. Now, looking at, just like picking up from where Agogo has stopped, most of the African leaders, he's asking, he's talking about the level of transparency. Now, we see that there, there's a scramble of sorts to try to, you know, gag or do some damage control as to the, the leak that has already happened. Um, but do you see any move from African presidents whatsoever? Do you see this um, maybe happening, in the, like in the case, for example, a Jacob Zuma who's facing um, you know, some uh, case of financial misappropriation and, and other matters? Uh, do you see that in other African countries, including Nigeria, taking it up for real? Or are the leaders just going to let it blow over from experience? Um, I, I think that, um, you know, uh, what we are seeing uh, from the West, you know, countries outside Africa, is symptomatic of the, um, the values they have in those parts of the world, um, where the leaders are accountable to the people and where they are asked and expected to come out and make, um, uh, uh, you know, give explanations. Um, sometimes they apologize to the public and sometimes they also resign voluntarily. Um, but it will be interesting to see if African leaders who have been fingered or named in the Pandora papers, I almost said Panama papers, like my colleague on the other side. I mean, it will be interesting to see if African leaders who toe that line. I mean, historically and traditionally, we have not been known to have leaders who resign voluntarily. Historically and traditionally, we have not known to have leaders who give a, um, you know, two cents about what the people think. Um, even the outrage that has greeted such uh, a revelation is not as much as you have in the western part of the of the globe. So um, I'll be surprised if we 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 see some of the levels of uh, explanation and um, you know uh, alibis and you know uh, we've been getting. But in terms of denials, of course, we'll be seeing that. For instance, uh, Peter will be the former governor of Anambra State, and recently, most recently, the vice uh, uh, the, the, the vice presidential running mate um, in the presidential election. He he said that um, he he was not at um, uh, so at, uh, he was not expected to reveal to the Code of Conduct Bureau um, uh, his assets, um, which he shared with other people, and that uh, this company had other persons on board. It wasn't just him. That's Gabriella Investment, which, by the way, is registered in his daughter's name. You know, so uh, this is the excuse he has given. Peter B is a gentleman, you know, but, um, I mean, if you're talking about the bongos in, in, in Gabon, they they they're... they're, they're yeah, the, the history of their expenditure and expenses is well documented. I mean, the man's son is vice president of the country. Uh, he's a playboy on Instagram, and uh, he does not, um, you know, spare any effort in showing his, his lavish lifestyle on Instagram, just like Hush Puppy did. You know, and if he cared about what people thought, he would not be, you know, showing such a lavish and extravagant lifestyle. You know, for crying out loud, the man, the president's son, is the vice president of Gabon. So, you know. He's also been fingered and, and investigated in France um, by some French lawyers and judges um, over some corruption allegations where even his uh, expensive sports cars uh, that are kept in France, he uses that anytime he gets to, I'm talking about Bongo, anytime he gets to, to, to France. Those were taken away um, through the order of a judge. Um, so he vehemently denied this. So we'll have the denials. But in terms of 
for any contrition, I don't think uh, African leaders really um, feel they, uh, they can be held to account by their people. But of course, I'll expect denials, yes. I mean, we've seen instances. I mean, Jacob Zuma is one of the uh, instances I gave earlier on. But I think in early um, 2020, we had the same issue in, I think, Algeria, if I'm not mistaken, where the, uh, the, the leader and his daughter had you know, same issues of um, financial misappropriation. And it was followed, you know, it's been followed um, through. Uh, but when we, when we say that we're not sure that African countries or African leaders might do this, is it because of the people themselves not being able to push for it? Or is it that maybe the ones that have, one way or the other, been brought to book is because of consistency from maybe outside, um, countries outside, or maybe people in diaspora pushing for it to happen? Because you sound more like, it's something that will blow over. You know, uh, by, by, by the, by the um, <clears throat> number of revelations we've had in, 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 in Nigeria, um, you know, some will say uh, 10, you know, um, prominent Nigerians, you know, named in the Pandora Paper Week for the, the, the publication. Uh, um, you would have expected, you know, um, a lot of public concentration on this, a lot of public condemnation, and even to an extent, even protests, if, if, if that is possible. Um, we've had several Pandora papers in Nigeria. Um, there, there's a lot of it. I mean, people have been filmed stashing foreign currencies into their clothes. People have been filmed, you know, offering bribes. People have been fingered in corruption. You know, investigations have been taken to court, and then they switch political party, and the case dies. There's several Pandora papers in the last few years in the current democratic dispensation in Nigeria, nothing has happened. People have gone about their basic, you know, uh, their daily life. And, I mean, you talk to the average man on the street, he would, he, he would even justify it by saying, oh, if, if the man who is my brother or my the man who is my sister gets into a position of authority in government and does not amass wealth for himself so he can share to his, his family and his uh, uh, village people, then he has failed. So it's almost a way of life. So you're, you saying, know, so, so, so you're saying, bottom line, that we encourage, we aid and abate these people and, and the corruption that is going on within I, I, our, our country. I'm saying that civil society, you know, the media can, can throw some light on it. We're going to talk about it for some time and it'll go away. It'll wow. go away. I was just telling someone about this issue. I was saying, you see, we have corruption in every part of the world. The difference is that they have systems and laws that are effective and deal with people. So if you have anything corrupt going on, you want to think twice about it because when the law catches up with you, the law will be no respect of persons. Well, in Nigeria, um, what are we going to expect? In La Côte d'Ivoire, what can we expect? The president of La Côte d'Ivoire, Ouattara, was part of a delegation that visited um, uh, uh, um, Dumbuya, who is now just been sworn in as the head of state of um, the Republic of Guinea to tell him that he needed to hand over power back to a democratic president and that he needed to step aside. Now, this is the same man who um, went against the country's constitution, tinkered with it, and ran for office for a third term with the support of France. You know, so Africa in general, we, we, <laughs> we, we have laws that are not effective. I mean, presidents are able to tinker with, you know, the constitution. And that was what's going on in Guinea, by the way. Okay. They tinker with the constitution to favor themselves. Mm. They're able to appoint their children as vice president, their children as ministers. We can go to uh, uh, Angola, where for years the Dos Santos family has been known to be very wealthy. Um, I mean, the, the daughter of the, the president then, Dos Santos, she is one of the wealthiest women in the world. That was the country I was referring this, this to. Money. It was Angola, not Algeria. Yes, Angola. Angola, yes. yes. Angola, yes, yes. yes. And, you know, um, I mean, I mean, these, these, are, these are families that were not wealthy and became wealthy when they were in power. So this is Africa for you. And the people mm. will accept it as that. And will also try to see how they can get themselves a piece of the cake. Okay. Um, to you, Mr. Johnson, it's, it's very interesting that, you know, we're having this conversation and everybody seems to be sounding very alike and there's not a, a, a dint of optimism out there that we can hold on to, even as I've pointed to some of the things that have happened. Um, but this is just as I said, we've had Panama Papers, we've had so many papers. So what, what difference does this make for us in the country? Now, before now, we were talking about the difference between um, it being illegal and it being unethical. Unethical, Let's yes. draw a line between you know, unethical and illegal. Yes. Um, putting money 
in tax havens to save yourself from paying taxes or what have you might not necessarily be illegal. Okay. Now, it would most times be unethical. Sometimes it would be illegal, depending on the tax system you have in your own country. Okay. And then, of course, the, the other question is, how was the money made in the first place? Most of them illegally, I, I agree. So um, some wealthy families, let's forget the politicians now, some wealthy families. Like the King of Jordan? Exactly. Some wealthy families will keep doing that. It will not end. They'll keep doing why, that. Why do they keep doing Because, you, you, know, you see, the simple person, and this is the, I think this is the debate in the U.S. right now between um, those who follow um, the, the former presidential aspirant, what's his name, Ben, um, what's his name now? Presidential aspirant? Yeah, presidential candidate for the Democrats. Um, he's, he's been pushing that the rich pay taxes. But we see okay, that Benny most Sanders, of, yeah. Benny Sanders. Now, he's insisting that these rich people pay taxes, and it's almost the same thing that they're pushing right now in the UK. Uh, so if the rich keep taking their monies to tax havens because they can, and the common man or the middle class is continuously, <laughs> you know, drained of their monies, yeah. it's, isn't that both illegal and unethical? No, it might be unethical. But I, I assure you, if it were illegal, whenever it's illegal, the American... Um, um, government will clamp down immediately on the person. So most times it is the rich, the wealthy families that can afford the accountants and the lawyers and the consultants and can hide their money. Uh, they do this because they want the money to last through the generations. And for instance, in Africa, it would keep happening because Africa is still a place where some governments are uncertain. So, Afri well, Africa is poor while we're... we're no, Africa is to... not poor. Well, we are. Africa is wealthy. We're wealthy. We have well, well, natural... We are poor. For example, <laughs> let's use Nigeria. I'll go help me out. We're, <laughs> we think that we're rich, but we're poor as we speak. Mm -hmm. We're still borrowing. We're asking for help. Yeah. But then we're sending our monies to fund other economies and build it while exactly. ours is suffering. Exactly. Again, what I find it, it is, really hard to... What it is, uh, Marianne, is that it is clear. When you look at Gabon, you look at Nigeria, you look at Angola, you look at these countries. You, you may say the people there are poor, but the countries are wealthy. Hmm. Now, Nigeria is a wealthy country. It has been mismanaged. It is borrowing, God knows, about a billion a day, if you, if you, you understand. Break it down, uh, yes. If you break it down. So it's a matter of management. Well, you can't tell me that with the gas reserves we have, with the crude we still have, that we're a poor country. With the human resources we have, 200 million people, we're not a poor country. But the people there are poor. And going back to your question, it will continue this way, and the whole thing will go away because of the people. The people fail to hold the leadership to account. We've become numb. We almost expect it. Uh, most people will tell you, only 10 Nigerian politicians, only? You understand? So that, that is the sad situation. Unfortunately. Um, Agua, let me come back to you because I, I want us to talk about the two politicians, let's, let's, let's not forget that in this, this report, we're yet to see the other Nigerians and their names, uh, but we have seen two names, uh, and um, I want us to examine the personalities of these two people. Uh, until last week, governor, former Governor Peter Albi is talking about how to restructure Nigeria, how to reposition us for progress and this and that, and now his name is appearing on this report, and he's given us some, you know, um, He's, he's argued some deniability and said that, you know, um, he didn't think it was necessary to have certain information, um, you know, with the CCB. But what does this do looking at, you know, I mean, because we know that he's had political ambitions and still will have political ambitions. And don't forget, this is a time in the country's um, life where people are pushing for a southern presidency or some leadership from the south, whether it be southeast or south-south. 
What does this do to his image and his political career in the country? Will he even brush as much as brush it? Well, interestingly, he's, he's, he even did uh, grant an interview to the, to the Premium Times, uh, who were collaborating with the ICIG from the Nigerian side. And it was interesting to hear his comments. You know, he said, look, I did not take Anambra State money. Um, his only concern was with his international affiliations, how he would be viewed. And um, he sort of believes that uh, the people who can look at his track record as a governor of Anambra State, uh, which he says it is uh, un untainted. And um, I'm sure you could probably, for him to be able to take that sort of position, he probably knows what he's talking about. About his political capital, whether it's there or not, um, maybe in Anambra State, the people in Abga can say uh, whether whether he whether he's uh, that um, powerful enough to get those votes if he decides to throw his hat ahead of the 2023 general election. But if you take your mind back to 2007 um, or 2006, late 2006, in the run up to the uh, general elections, then you remember former President Shekhar Abbas and Jody put out the list of what they consider to be the most corrupt Nigerians who were not fit to buy for office. Over, over 250 names were there about it. It began with 400 and then it trimmed down to 250. And there was a lot of argument whether uh, the EFCC then had the powers to decide who can be a uh, vital office or not. Only Atiku Abubakar then, you know, decided to take on the, uh, the president uh, of Boston and John up to the Supreme Court. And then it was said that you, do, you cannot, um, um, EFC doesn't have the power to say you cannot contest for election when that time happens. And he went on the contest 2007 election. But it just went, went on to show exactly how these things play out. All of those names you had on that list, none of them ever went, went before the court. There's a difference between when, when a politician has been indicted, uh, which is, you know, there's a reasonable doubt around the person, and when it gets to court, which is a different matter entirely, which I'm sure people uh, will understand about how this thing happened in, in the jurisprudence when people go to court and then they say whether you have enough evidence to prove beyond reasonable doubt uh, that this has been a case of corruption. So when people say, uh, we look at what Peter Obi has said, and uh, whether or not that would disqualify him. And he said, you can go and go check and find out whether any of those things uh, will affect me. Atiku Bagudu is at the end of his, uh, his tenure as governor of Kebbi State by next year. Um, uh, interesting politician, one of the more progressive politicians in the, in the Northwest. Um, interesting, the state hasn't been beaten by the uh, bandit board the way it's hit other states like uh, Kaduna okay. and uh, Katsina, Sokotu, and Zamfara State. Uh, he can point to some other uh, interesting things that happened during his tenure. This thing about the Abacha loot and his role there has been there, you know. Um, there, there's been talk about this for a number of but, months, but, but, years. That, but does that not, again, call to question how we think and how we, how we function in this country, whether we're followers or leaders, uh, even in, including law enforcement? The fact that he had this looming and he still is a governor, a sitting governor in a state, and nothing said, nothing questioned. And now here we are again with some questionable, maybe unethical, maybe illegal issues hanging around his neck again. Absolutely. So, you, so you, yeah, I've seen a lot of comments, uh, a number of people saying that the state assembly, the lawmakers in Kebbi State, uh, can call for you know, the panel to look into maybe start impeachment possibly. You know the way the state assemblies work in the country. They're just um, lap dogs to the executive. I dare say I've not seen any state governor, any state, any state assembly that said you carry out impeachment processes, more likely with the deputy governor, but not the sitting governor. The closest we had maybe was with Peter Obi uh, then as uh, governor of Anambra. But look what happened afterwards. Within uh, a couple of weeks, uh, it, 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 the, the entire thing was turned upside down and, it, and he got back into office. And, and he, but uh, to imagine that any state governor serving who is mentioned in this pan, uh, uh, Pandora uh, papers, will, who, who the state assembly will decide to begin impeachment proceedings. It's very, very unlikely because the exec, the governors are very powerful. They control all of the institutions. So it goes back to the question about the strength of the institutions, whether it's with the judiciary or the legislature or with the, uh, the law enforcement. You know, there's a lot of weakness in how they're able to stand up against the sort of things that we're going to see uh, play out with, I guess, with the Amanda 10 uh, names that happen. Hmm. Let me go to you, Kofi, before we come back to Mr. Johnson. Um, just as I said, the institutions 
as we all know, are not as strong as the men that we have in this country. But then that leaves uh, the fourth estate to, you know, um, be in this struggle somewhat alone. And, and we've also been taking a lot of flack uh, as a result of that, speaking truth to power, and sometimes even highlighting certain issues that have been swept under the carpet. So again, um, in, in pushing for us to be able to deal with these issues or call for some level of accountability, um, we have also been seen as maybe major critics of government or even sometimes the enemy of a state, of the state. Uh, I mean, we've recently seen a, a publication with a lot of facts, even though we're yet to hear any rebuttal on conflicts for Boko Haram. That's a different conversation for another day. That's from a journalist. Do you, it, does it seem to you sometimes, as someone who's on the radio every day talking about these issues and asking for people's opinion, does it seem to you like maybe we're not doing enough or saying the right things so that Nigerians can really receive, for want of a better word, receive sense? Um, it, you know, it, it seems, it, I mean, I know we're not doing enough. And uh, I, I know, I'm sure you'd agree with me, that we need to do more. But we, we, we operate in a peculiar part of the world. You see this Pandora paper um, uh, papers that have, has come out with the investigation. You look at the number of um, uh, media organizations that were involved. Um, you look at the resources that were utilized by these media organizations to, you know, come out with this report and the cross-border, cross-national, cross-continental effort it took. Now, you look at our media organizations on the African continent and indeed in Nigeria, and you look at the resources that that we have to do um, investigative journalism. I mean, this the whole effort was, was, was put together by International Consortium of Investigative uh, Journalists, the ICIG. Um, um, the media in Nigeria really is struggling as far as funds are concerned. And investigative journalism is not, is not cheap. I mean, I get people calling into my radio program to give me information, and then to the, the, the next thing they say, Miriam, you're aware of this, because we, we hosted a, a morning radio program for many years together. And they would say, oh, you are an, investig you are an investigative journalist. Go and investigate. And then I will say, hey, excuse me, excuse me, hold on. You think it's free to investigate? You think I can just stand up and go? You know, people go to war zones, and they have their people. How many journalists have life insurance. How many journalists are working in organizations where their basic Medicare, their HMO is even guaranteed, taken care of? So it is not cheap. We're not doing enough, but Nigerian journalists are doing the best they can. We should do more, but unfortunately, and we're not able to. Guess what? We say that the the, the, the law, and I, I, really, I hope the, if the gentleman uh, who is with you in the studio is a lawyer, my, my sincere respects and apologies to him. I do not mean to, you know, demean his profession. But they say the law is a hope of a common man. Um, in Nigeria, the media is the hope of a common man because everybody has an issue, they bring it to you, the journalists. All right, they, 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 the human rights are abused, they come to you. They've taken their land, they come to you. They, uh, someone stole from them, they come to you. They have a complaint to make to government, they come to you because those in authority are not accessible. And the nearest person they can think of is, 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 is the radio house, the television the station. So a lot needs to be done, but um, I think Nigerian journalists are doing the best they can. You know, we are playing a critical role. The, the press, being the media, uh, uh, is, I think, basically the only organization or uh, a professional body mentioned in the Nigerian constitution to hold the public office holders accountable, keep them accountable on behalf of the people. So we have a critical role to play, and we need to keep doing that within uh, the scope of our, our resources. Okay. Mr. Johnson, Kofi just helped you ask my last question because I, I, my last question obviously was where's the place of the judiciary, the, where's the place of law, uh, the law in this, knowing um, also that, you know, recently the judiciary has had a lot of question marks, you know, around it. And just as he said, it used to be the hope of the common man. But now we're not really sure if that's where we want to go. But let's see how you defend the judicial, uh, the judiciary and, of course, the law profession. <laughs> Uh, the, um, for instance, um, the, the legal profession is still the hope of the common man. Unfortunately, with the state of the economy and the fact that governance is no longer 
being done for the benefit of the people, I make bold to say. Access to justice is very expensive now. Someone comes into your office, this happened to me, the police did this or that. You say, okay, we have to file. When you get to the federal high court, you have to pay. You, you understand? And then there are times where you have costs that run up and up, and it's, it becomes expensive for those who are indigent, who, those who cannot afford to, um, to, to, to pay and do what they should do. So it becomes more difficult. But by and large, the, um, uh, there was a judgment where the Supreme Court jurist said that, um, he said the Constitution is the fonset origo, the, the, the fountain from which all other laws flow. Mm -hmm. And that if there is mud in one part of that fountain, naturally, it will flow all around. The situation in the country now is that corruption has become cancerous. It's at all spheres of government, society, schools, universities, churches, mosques, you name it. And the problem there is that when you have that, it is bound to seep into the judiciary. It's bound to seep even into the EFCC. So who checks the, who checks the exactly. legislature? Where who checks do the we, executive if the you, judiciary you see, that, itself that, is... That's the problem. You see, those who are within the corridors of power, decision makers, I don't think they're up to 2% of this country. You understand? So if the people themselves do not realize that they're being shortchanged because some people are cutting corners and are not um, law-abiding people, then it will continue. Hmm. Unfortunately, those who are perpetrating these things are the people who we are looking to to amend the laws or to implement the laws or to protect us. So we find ourselves in between a rock and a hard place, unfortunately. Yeah. But on that note, I cycle. want to say thank you, gentlemen. I will obol, uh, Kofi Bartels, Ladipo Johnson. Thank you very much Thanks for being part lot. of the conversation. I appreciate it. All right. Well, we'll take a short break. And when we return, we will be discussing what's happening in the Southeast. And of course, we advise the Arawa Group as for northern governors as regards IPOP's citizen border back shortly.